Good morning. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming to our, our first breakout session. Uh, this session is entitled Career Pathways Evaluation Design. Uh, with us, we have three uh, esteemed colleagues, all from APT Associates, Howard Ralston, Alan Werner, and Laura Peck. Their bios are in uh, the program book, so I won't say all the good things that I could say about them, and instead we'll reserve time for presentations and then question and answers. Uh, first will be Howard Ralston. Howard is going to talk about the ISIS evaluation design. Is this on? Okay, good. Thank you, Brandon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, uh, bright lights in my brain don't get along too well, so I'm mostly going to be looking down, but, uh, you know, if, if you need to get my attention, you can just say, I'll, you, you know, yo, Howard, or something like that, and I will look up. So what I hope to do uh, is to accomplish, oops, this is the wrong, this is, this is, the... oh, okay. That's all right. Should I go back or just leave it alone? Well, why don't I, I'll just start talking and when it's ready to get to my slides, just let me know. So what I want to do this morning is to try to accomplish two things. One is to briefly describe the subject matter. What is a career pathways program? Um, the second thing I want to do is, having described sort of in general what a career pathways program is and given some examples of the kinds of things that are involved, is to say how the career pathways conceptual framework drives the design of ISIS. ISIS, for those of you who don't know, is a project called Innovative Strategies for Increasing Self-Sufficiency, which is sponsored by ACF and uh, the evaluation is being conducted by APT Associates and a number of research partners. So in addition to uh, uh, describing the conceptual framework that underlies career pathways uh, for the purpose of saying how it undergirds the uh, ISIS evaluation design, I hope it will also serve as a uh, introduction to the session because it's relevant to both of the following presentations too. So to do this in what will be somewhere in the range, I hope, of 15 to 20 minutes, I will at the outset say be oversimplifying. Um, and I don't think that that will create too much of a problem, but uh, if it does, uh, hopefully it will be corrected by others or in the discussion part of the session. So, um, First, I want to sort of mention what I think are sort of three critical, if you like, facts that uh, are central to the ISIS design. First, um, the, there is a general career, career pathways conceptual framework which uh, is very central to understanding what career pathways program is and also to understanding the, why we've designed the evaluation as we have. Um, it's not a program model. We are not operating with a program model that undergirds all of the programs that are uh, in, um, in ISIS. They follow different program models, all under the general career pathways framework. So I think one way to get at this is to think of career pathways as a systematic set of responses to a, the diagnosis of a problem. So it's a broad theory of change that is, uh, undergirds a whole set of potential responses, a response being a program uh, that falls under this framework. Um, the third thing that is sort of in another dimension is that the design, the basic impact design of ISIS is a random assignment uh, study. So it randomly assigns individuals who are eligible for a program either to have access to that program, a career pathways program, of course, or to have access to other services in the community. 
It's what's known as a single arm design. It's not as if there are sort of multiple different programs you could be assigned to. You're either assigned to the Career Pathways program uh, or you're assigned to, um, to the uh, uh, you know, control condition, which is access to other programs in the community. So what these will mean, and that I'll talk about uh, in several times in, in the, the course of the discussion, is that each program within ISIS, the nine programs that I referenced there, will be the subject of its own evaluation. That there will be some cross-site uh, evaluation uh, subjects, but the core uh, focus will be at the individual site. And uh, in describing sort of the, the uh, Career Pathways program uh, framework, that I hope it will become apparent why we've moved in that direction. So to describe the problem and the diagnosis, which career pathways is a set of responses, I'm going to tell what I believe is an accurate but vastly oversimplified uh, story. Uh, and I, but I think the story will be useful at getting at the heart of what the substance is. So, once upon a time, there were, at least in the neighborhood I grew up in, the community I grew up in, something called junior colleges. Um, and these junior colleges were like senior colleges in that they had a strong but not exclusive liberal arts perspective. Um, Junior colleges served, or were intended to serve, as less, in, less expensive feeders to senior colleges, especially for those who were perhaps less prepared for college, but nonetheless college-bound. They were typically two-year schools, and the expectation was at the end of two years people would transfer from a junior to a senior college. Over time, these schools became more occupationally focused, as did their sort of bigger brothers, too, the senior colleges. And more and more adults seeking to improve the labor market outcomes uh, started to attend them. The, um, and I think, on average, if the notion that originally the junior colleges were for people who might not be fully college ready, uh, and were less prepared, even more unprepared people seeking to improve their economic prospects uh, entered these schools. So the problem with this is the approach to colleges were not entirely well suited and it did not work so well for adults seeking to increase their skill level. And the big problem that emerged over time is that there were extremely low completion rates. Um, and that not only were there low completion rates so that many adults attempted to improve their skill levels but did so, were unsuccessful in getting the skills, let alone improving their labor market outcomes, uh, those that did usually proceeded very slowly. So they spent a lot of time doing that. So this problem gave rise to a lot of diagnoses, um, all of which I think have important truths in them. First of all, one notion was that the programs were too sequential. Uh, the expectation was that for people with low basic skills and, uh, that they would first remedy those basic skills before they could get into the occupational part. Um, a second problem is the program, the, 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 uh, the uh, programs offered were often incompatible with work and that work conflicts, especially for people who might not have regular work schedules, um, created difficulties in, in, in completion. A third problem identified is that they were too opaque. Uh, it was too hard to navigate how to get from here to there and how to come out the end with a uh, credential that could be of value in the labor market. Connected to that is there are too many, cho too many choices, in which it's too hard to understand what the, imp of the, uh, the impact was of making a particular choice. Third problem, too little financial support. 
A lot of the people who attended were low income. If they got into problems, uh, you know, working and supporting, they might have to work more, and that meant they had to study less. Too little social supports. We weren't dealing with people who may be, uh, uh, you know, focused only on school. Many would be working. Uh, there was little support from others, mostly people who were sort of ended up as commuters. Uh, a final thing, and there's more on the list I could do, but in the interest of time, is there was too little link to employment and employers. So one could end, finally at the end end up with something, and it may ha end up having less value in the labor market. So we can look at career pathways, I think most illuminating, as a systematic set of responses to attempt to deal with lack of uh, high rates of completion. So key career pathway ideas that I think are in some ways implicit in some of the, uh, uh, what I've said so far. First of all, they deal with a wide range of skill and other needs. So the skills that are involved are potentially anywhere from uh, basic foundational academic skills to very refined occupational specific skills. But it's not just skills that the programs attempt to deal with, they attempt to deal with these other needs. Uh, for example, financial supports potentially. If you noticed here, I've already introduced the idea of adults and youth, so you can see one indication of where my story was too simple. Um, but we'll just pass over that for the moment. A second element of career pathways programs that's very prominent is to create management well articulated training steps. And is that's really where the notion of the pathways comes from. So instead of something that's an opaque course catalog, the idea is to substitute transparency, a well lit pathway that the person can see where they are on the pathway, how it connects to future steps, and that it all makes sense. So there is choice, but it's limited and it's structured. Sort of a third element is that career pathways programs have an occupational focus. It's omnipresent. Uh, those occupations can vary greatly uh, depending on the program, but there's always something, uh, an occupational uh, um, focus included. And finally, and by getting back to the idea that people need a multiple systems to sort of navigate through. Um, Katie, does that mean I've used five minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, that um, it needs to have a, a, a broad group of partners to be responsive to those needs. So very briefly, I want to show you a, a diagram, which I'm not going to be able to spend a lot of time on, but if you sort of look at it, sort of going from left to right, from lower to higher skills, um, and hopefully to lower to higher employment and earnings, that what it really reflects is a broad range of skill building. So the programs aren't necessarily confined to a single area, like you know, a basic bridge program, which would deal with remediation. Um, second is there's education and there's employment all the way along the arrow. Um, it's not like employment just occurs at the end uh, of, of the arrow. There, you can get on and off at various places. And if you look at uh, the nine programs in the study, in fact, all except one, the programs don't deal with the whole area, the whole arrow. They deal with parts of it but uh, not the entirety of it. So uh, not everything is gonna be universal. The whole sort of pathway to the bottom to the top isn't spelled out. Uh, I hope people can see this, although I don't want to focus too heavily on the whole thing. I'll come back to it several times. So the um, important thing right now I want you to focus on is the left-hand side. This is a theory of change for career pathways that really drives the ISIS evaluation design. So for the moment, what I want to focus on in finishing up my description of career pathway programs is the left-hand side, which is program inputs. Because these are what are 
what we refer to as the signature uh, strategies, sort of what the programs are and what the, uh, um, how, how they're structured. Again, we use the term signature because these are not universal. It's not like every program has every aspect here. And in order to sort of, again, uh, not spend uh, 15 minutes on this slide, I'll just call attention to a couple things. One is, one of the key elements is assessment. If people have a broad set of needs that go beyond just their academic situation, and we're gonna deal with those needs to have a more successful outcome, we have to sort of look at both academic and non-academic skills. We may have to sort of look at how much money somebody has to undertake this training program, what their budget is, and do they have the money to actually to be able to support themselves while they're just doing this and potentially a family. Um, second, there are a whole lot of kind of key strategies in terms of instruction that are often present. I will just focus on a couple of them because um, contextualization and acceleration, but if we sort of go back to the idea that people may be in the, the, the kind of regular world of community colleges, lost in the jungle of remedial work, never to emerge, never actually even to make it to occupational training. One way, of course, to remedy that is to try to introduce occupational training earlier and link it to, the, uh, to basic skills remediation. That's you know contextualization. There are many different notions that go with it, but the idea that people might learn better by learning both at the same, and it might also help them maintain their motivation. Uh, along with that is the idea of acceleration. If the path is so long that people can't um, uh, likely emerge from it, um, we need to shorten it. Okay, I won't go through all the other things in the interest of time. I'm not going to show you the map. So what this means is that, um, skipping to the second bullet, all the ISIS sites exemplify the central career pathway ideas, but they vary greatly in how they do it. They vary greatly in their subject populations. Some may focus on people who don't have a high school degree. For another, it may be necessary to have a high school degree. Some programs focus on people who are close to college ready, perhaps reading at the 10th or 11th grade and not quite there. Others may start with people who are at the sixth grade level. So these big basic sort of differences in target populations lead also to sort of different needs for a variety of, of training steps. Um, uh, the also, just to sort of make clear that the, um, um, this is not just talking about lead organizations, but that the lead uh, as community colleges, but some of them are, but there are also others that are community-based organizations, others that are workforce investment boards, all in some way or other, though, linked to colleges. So the upshot of this is that the number of factors differing across site and the small sample of sites really preclude statistically identifying ex explanations for site difference, cross site differences. Um, I'm mentioning that because as you'll see, this is a different perspective in, in, the, in the design that uh, Laura and this design that Alan will describe. Um, ours and ISIS will be a deep dive into nine separate programs and we will pr produce nine separate reports for each site. We'll take advantage of a common core of data collection, but what we will use will vary by, um, by uh, site, by program. Okay, so three elements to the study that I'll describe briefly and their da data sources, uh, implementation study, impact study, cost-benefit analysis. So the goal of the sort of thinking back to the, uh, the design, I'll just skip forward here. The goal of the implementation study is to understand in depth the left side of the diagram, the program input. Um, to document the design of the career pathways program, to define how it was implemented related to the design, and very importantly for both the implementation and the impact study, 
to describe differences in the level, type, duration, content, and completion of services received by the treatment and the control group. Because essentially, given that this is an experiment, the treatment is really defined not simply as what the treatment group got, but what the treatment got, group got compared to what the control group got. Because we know many will seek services outside of the program who are in the control group. Uh, and we'll also, of course, though, want to very carefully document um, the uh, experience of the treatment group. So we have a wide variety of uh, data sources for the implementation study. Uh, so we'll be talking to and interviewing and having surveys for program staff, instructors, case managers, employers, and other stakeholders. And, potential, and supervisors of people who come out the other end. Very importantly, in the fifth bullet, we will have a 15-month follow-up survey of treatment and control group members. And that'll be a main way that we'll establish what really did the treatment group get over and above what the control group uh, got. Um, we'll also have in dip interviews with treatment and control groups. And this information will be uniform across all the sites. What we will use in a particular site may vary, but we will have this uniform data. And in addition, we will have using program administrative data, data that are unique to the site. Where am I supposed to be pointing? Hmm. Oops, pushing the wrong button. <laughs> Too many green buttons. Um, so what are the key questions uh, related to the MTAC study? I'm going to go past this to, the, um, to the, uh, um, the theory of change uh, diagram again. So the main, the primary questions for the study are the things that are over in the right-hand side. Um, we want to understand how each program's the net impacts on, on primary outcomes. And we define primary outcomes as educational attainment. Do people, in fact, for example, end up with more degrees? Do they end up with the higher numbers of credit hours? Um, we also, of course, want to know, because fundamentally the purpose of these programs is to increase people's position in the labor market, is do people earn more money? Um, that is really a fundamental question for defining the success of the program. Uh, but we're interested beyond just things like their earnings. We're also interested in do they get you know, greater levels of, uh, of uh, employment benefits? Uh, do they persist in employment? Are they more likely to be working in the occupational area in which they were studying? And the other thing that comes out of that on the right-hand side that we're interested in is, does this ultimately improve individual and family well-being? If people's earnings go up, do their income go up with that? Uh, do they end up with greater assets? Or potentially less, perhaps, they end up taking on debt uh, that doesn't offset them. Um, do their children do better? So this is sort of the ultimate kind of test are these primary outcomes on the right-hand side. But what goes on in the middle is also important because these are the devices by which people uh, have designed these programs with the intention of improving the things on the right-hand side. So these include, uh, well, I should sort of mention very briefly on the left-hand side, just go back to reminding you that we will understand the program inputs from the perspective of not only implementation but also impact. But we have a bunch of things in the middle that we hope are, the programs hope, are precursors of um, the, the uh, outcomes on the right-hand side. So will foundational academic skills be improved? Will occupational skills be improved? Uh, psychosocial factors. Will people have demonstrate greater ability to stick with and fulfill their plans? Uh, will they have more academic self-confidence? Uh, will they understand better uh, what it is to be involved in a career and how to move up through it? 
Uh, will they show, if especially in a program that has uh, an emphasis on financial supports, will they show less uh, economic hardship and more ability to manage their, uh, their uh, household budget? So what we will have then is a, um, um, I'll describe sort of the, the data sources of how we're going to get at some of these uh, questions. Um, first of all, we have a baseline. Uh, it includes, you know, things like, uh, you know, demographics, age, sex, uh, educational background, uh, household structure, and so on. Uh, there's a self-administered questionnaire. This is something that's done in privacy, where people ask a variety of questions about, uh, answer a variety of questions related to things like academic self-confidence, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, career orientation, like what are their educational aspirations, what kind of, how far do they expect to go, and so on, and other elements. They're also, those will be asked and are being asked across all the sites. They, we also use where they're available basic skills assessments that the sites administer for programmatic purposes. So we'll also have follow-up surveys because we can't answer everything. Uh, um, it's, well, we'll have two sources of, of follow-up information. One are surveys. One, the first survey is at 15 months. We expect a second somewhere around 30 to 36 months, and a final one potentially of 60 months. The 15-month survey, again, the focus will vary by program. If we have a program that's designed um, to uh, primarily help people attain two-year degrees, we have a very different sort of window of expected impacts than one where the focus is in getting somebody a short-term certificate. Um, so we'll have the same information across the various sites, but we'll use different information depending on the particular program model that a site, uh, that a site is following. So um, in some, a, a shorter program, a focus on uh, employment outcomes might be important. On the other hand, although we are going to be interested in employment outcomes in a longer program, um, we're going to have different expectations. We may well expect that people's earnings will go down while they're making this investment in education. Uh, finally, uh, at, you know, 30 and 36 months, the focus will change more to the, the right-hand side, but not necessarily exclusively and in, at the longer term follow-up that uh, we hope the study will involve, uh, we'll really turn to uh, the right-hand side pretty much exclusively. So we also will have administrative records data. Um, we'll have uh, as available and related to particular sites, uh, state and local sources of college records information. Um, we'll have uniformly from the National Student Clearinghouse enrollment information, institutions attended and major degrees completed, uh, and very importantly, we'll have wage records uh, on everybody in the sample. So I, I, in, in summing up, uh, before I get just very briefly to the cost-benefit analysis, what we have then is sort of a very comprehensive uh, data collection that will focus on all of the elements of the career pathways uh, uh, theory of change. We won't focus in every site on every element of that theory of change. We're going to sort of particularize that theory of change to the particular strategies that a program has adopted and then we'll focus on that data uh, that is pertinent to the particular program. So then finally, uh, we'll have a uh, cost-benefit analysis. In the long run, do the program's economic benefits outweigh its cost? Um, that's going to be a critical question to answer. We're, these programs are making investments in people, and we want to know ultimately whether those investments pay off. So just to get to the end for a minute, skipping a couple, there's some contact information if you would like further information on the study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. So one point Howard didn't mention, um, 
which will, I think, segue into Alan's presentation, is the ISIS project started without ACF sort of telling apt, this is what we want to, to do. And in, in fact, it evolved through a process of consultation and, and really seeing where the field was, was at. And over time, the team got to fo a focus on career pathways. That, that focus was sort of evolutionary, um, but it was also opportunistic because then with the Affordable Care Act, um, ACF received the funds for, uh, to create the Health Professions Opportunity Grant program, which is a, a, a career pathways program that, and sectoral training program that Alan Werner is now going to describe. Thank you, Brendan. And uh, thank you, Howard, for laying the foundation of the career pathways framework. It saves us some time. Um, so as Brendan uh, told you, my name is Alan Werner, and I'm the co-principal investigator. Can people hear me in the back? I'm the co-principal investigator of the Health Profession Opportunity Grants National Implementation Evaluation, uh, the, or the HPOG-NIE. Uh, and I'll be describing the study's background, context, and design. Uh, actually, I should wait until, can you, yeah, thank you. Um, the project is sponsored by OPRE. Molly Irwin and Hillary Forster are our project officers, and the Urban Institute is our partner on the study. Um, uh, I'm just going to go ahead. Oh, there you go. Thank you. So um, I'm going to cover a number of topics about the NIE today, including its policy and program context, and some detail on the study's goals and design, including the research questions, the design framework, the data collection strategy, and the various analyses that we'll undertake to address the research questions. So what is HPOG? Um, well, it's a number of five-year grants, for those of you who don't know, it's a number of five-year grants to support developmental education and vocational training programs uh, designed to train low-income individuals in high-demand occupations in the health professions, such as in nursing, nursing assistants, medical records personnel, and so on. The grants were authorized by the Affordable Care Act, and in um, HPOG's first fiscal year, 2011, the Office of Family As Assistance at HHS awarded $67 million to 32 grantees in 23 states. 27 grants went to programs targeting TANF recipients and other low-income individuals, and five went to tribal organizations. The target five-year program enrollments range from 165, big range, to 5,000, and annual grants range between one and five million dollars. This uh, slide presents some of the key features of uh, HPOG programs. Um, as I mentioned, they are designed to serve low-income individuals, and particularly those with relatively little work experience or vocational skills, and often with low educational attainment, the same target populations uh, for ISIS. Uh, the target population also includes those currently working in the healthcare industry, but at low-level jobs with little chance of career advancement without additional education and training. Um, the programs were designed to, to address two uh, growing problems, the shortfall in healthcare professionals and the growing need for some post-secondary education to get a decent job. Um, the programs are implemented by a variety of institutions as, as in ISIS, the most common grantees being community colleges or workforce and workforce in, investment boards with the two types of um, institutions often in partnership. This slide presents some of the more, uh, some more of the features of um, HPOG programs, uh, specifically important elements of program design. The HPOG programs implemented by the grantees vary in design, but they all include core elements of the career pathways framework that Howard introduced. Um, this uh, slide lists the core elements, and I'm, I'm not going to go over these again since Howard did such a great job. Oh, sorry. So here you go. These are reading glasses, and I can't see 10 feet in front of me, but I can see my notes, so I apologize for that. Um, 
so, um, yeah, so these are the, Howard talked about these uh, features and they ought to look pretty much like the ones he showed you for ISIS. Uh, we, and in fact, we drew on the career pathways framework that was initially developed for ISIS. It was very helpful for us. Um, as I said, the HPOG NIE is sponsored by OPRE and is one of a number of HPOG research projects that comprise a multi-pronged research agenda. And among the other projects are uh, the HPOG impact study, which my colleague Laura Peck will describe, uh, the evaluation of the HPOG tribal programs being connected by NORC, the HPOG implementation systems and outcome evaluation, not to be confused with the NIE, but that developed a design for the NIE. The ISIS project, uh, which um, I don't know if Brendan mentioned this or not. I guess you did. It, it includes three HPOG grantee programs, and we're going to use those data from the ISIS project in our, both in the NIE and the impact study. And then finally, the, finally, the university partnership research grants for HPOG, uh, they had their meeting yesterday here, which include awards to five university and HPOG grantee partnerships studying specific aspects of HPOG programs. Now the research questions. The, the NIE is designed to address the following questions. I'll just read them off. How are health professions training programs being implemented across the grantee sites? So what are these grantees doing? What changes to the service delivery system are associated with program implementation? A big concern of HHS was that um, low-income people did, were not getting enough good access to training programs in any profession, much less healthcare professions. So we want to see whether or not that has improved. What individual level outcomes and out, outputs and outcomes occur? So what are the results of participating, of enrolling in HPOG? And then finally, what, what key, key components and factors appear necessary or seem likely to contribute to the success of these programs? So this slide uh, presents a very high-level overview of the NIE design framework needed to address those questions. Um, and it entails the measurement, description, and analysis of the HPOG contextual factors, the eligible populations and their relevant demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, program administration, the specific program services and trainings uh, available to participants, the guts of the HPOG programs, and the results, program outputs and outcomes. Importantly, the design allows for the exploration of the interrelationships uh, among the variables and constructs measured within each of those, these domains. And that's the statistical statistical relationships, not just qualitative. Uh, this slide presents a logic model showing the several domains and their hypothesized causal relationships. Over the next few slides, um, don't worry about this, uh, I'll go over the, what's in the boxes. So among the HPOG contextual factors uh, in the NIE, that was a box I think in the upper left, are relevant community demographic and socioeconomic factors, as well as the relationship of the HPOG program to other similar training opportunities for low-income populations. We'll also be collecting data about the grantees' institutional identification and culture and experience with similar programs and target populations. In addition, we'll be examining the grantees' program partners and stakeholders. Uh, the study will also describe the local healthcare labor market and its influence on HPOG program design. Um, the NIE will describe the relevant characteristics of the eligible populations, including education and employment backgrounds, as well as household income. And for 23 of the 27 low-income and TANF grantees, we'll have information on the education and work-related attitudes and aspirations of HPOG participants, thanks to a supplemental baseline survey that's being implemented in the grantees included in the ISIS project and the HPOG impact, impact project. And that a supplemental baseline overlaps a bit with the self-administered questionnaire uh, that Howard described in ISIS, but it's really for a different purpose that uh, Laura, I think, will explain in her, in her um, talk. And then um, finally, among the contextual factors, we'll be describing each grantee's management and administrative structure including the degree to which services and trainings are contracted out or provided in-house. Also important is how centralized program administration is. 
is there one central administrative location or service location, or is the program decentralized across multiple local service sites? Uh, and do these sites operate distinct programs, programs that are simply different than the other sites under a grantee's aegis? Um, this, this slide presents the types of program components, the services and trainings that will be um, describing and measuring in each grantee and service site. These are, of course, the core of the HPOG initiative and the program factors, as Howard explained, closely related to participant success in education and employment. Moreover, these program factors are those most directly amenable to tweaking in the service of achieving better results for participants. So I think it's, it's really important to measure these variables and constructs accurately and in standard ways across grantees and sites. So they have to cover a lot of variation um, in target populations and available services and trainings. And as you'll see, this measurement is very important for our, a part of our design and the impact study. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through this list. Howard talked a bit about these components. Uh, I'll point out that we'll also be measuring the degree to which HBOG programs fit into the Career Pathways Framework. Do they do the things that that framework says ought to be done uh, to serve this, this non-traditional population? Moving along, this, uh, hmm? there you go. this slide presents the core output measures for the study, or the more immediate results of training. Uh, and they include measures of, a, very similar to ISIS, additional hours, of both basic and vocational education, as well as benchmarks for course completion and achievement, degrees, certifications, uh, uh, licenses, and the such, and the like. Um, additional program outputs include exposure to work-based learning and experience, such as apprenticeships, internships, and training in career awareness and work-related attitudes and behavior. Uh, here are the program outcomes we'll be measuring for the NIE. Among the shorter term outcomes are included a summary measure of education and training uh, accomplishments related to employability uh, and other outcomes, including employment, employment in healthcare, importantly, and wages and benefits on the job. For longer term outcomes, we'll be looking uh, at further education and training. For example, are participants on a true career pathway? Do they make their way along the rungs? Um, and uh, going back period periodically to upgrade their skills. Um, finally, as an optional task, we're preparing to measure changes in child and family well-being over time for grantees in the impact study. Uh, it's mainly in the service of the impact study, but it's an important descriptive element for us in the NIE as well, potentially. Now, as you might imagine, a project like the NIE that seeks to measure and describe such a wide range of, of uh, individual characteristics and outcomes and grantee and site-based factors um, that may be related to, to outputs and outcomes requires an equally wide-ranging data collection strategy. And the NIE will, will collect both administrative and survey data. This slide presents the administrative data sources. And one of the main sources is the MIS developed for HPOG, the performance reporting system of the PRS the PRS collects administrative data on the, at the individual grantee and site level. Among the individual level data are a broad set of demographic characteristics collected at program application or intake, including, for example, age, gender, ethnicity, family and household status, education, employment, background, and current status. Uh, the PRS also includes a post-intake record of services and trainings received by each participant. Um, as well as the completion status for each training course and the degrees, certifications, and licenses received. Finally, the PRS also records employment status at program entry and exit, as well as in-program changes in employment and employment as of six months following exit. At the grantee and site level, the PRS includes information about the grantee's institutional identity, its service providers, uh, as well as, most importantly, the services and trainings available to program participants. The next line uh, on this slide is a typo. I don't know how it got there, so just forget it's there. 
Uh, another uh, important source of administrative data, as in ISIS, is the National Directory of New Hires, the NDNH. Uh, the NDNH is maintained by the Office of Child Support Enforcement at HHS, and it includes the quarterly uh, employment and wage record, earnings record, for any individual working for an employer that reports to its state's quarterly wage reporting system, its unemployment insurance system, which is nearly every worker in the United States. The NDNH will be the major source of information uh, about individual level employment and earnings. We won't rely so much on the six month follow-up information that, um, that the grantees will be collecting uh, for that. Um, as I mentioned, the NIE will, uh, will be using, will collect both administrative and survey data. And the surveys we developed for the study are, in, are pretty extensive in their scope since they have as their mission the collection of standardized codable information about all of the variables and constructs included in that, um, in that logic model and all those boxes, or many of those boxes. The grantee survey is the largest and will gather comprehensive and comparable data across all grantees and sites about contextual factors, program administration and program components, including marketing, intake, assessments, counseling, supportive services, trainings, and all other program activities and services. The management and staff survey will explore management and staff approaches to key program services, to the delivery of key program services and activities, as well as beliefs and attitudes about the HPOG program and its target population. These data are important exploring the degree to which work-client interactions may be associated with program results. In large part to flesh out the contextual description of HPOG programs, as well as the level of systems change, we're also fielding a partner stakeholder survey. We also sometimes call that the network survey. Um, in the study, we distinguish between program partners who play an active role in program implementation and stakeholders who have some inst institutional interest in HPOG and interact with the program in some way. For example, a local or state healthcare employer organization or nurses society would be a good example of an HPOG stakeholder. Uh, the major purpose of the survey is to describe the network of agencies and institutions in which HPOG operates and to assess the system supporting HPOG and its goals and any systems changes since HPOG began and that might theoretically be ascribed to, to HPOG. Um, we're also conducting an employer survey to assess local healthcare employers Familiar, familiarity with HPOG, and for those who have hired HPOG graduates, the degree of satisfaction with the program. Another important survey, which I inadvertently admitted from this slide, but that Howard talked about, is the 15-month follow-up survey of program participants. Although this survey is mainly part of the impact study, the NIE will be using information from the survey in describing participant outcomes besides the, uh, those that we get through the NDNH. Finally, as an optional data collection task, we may conduct case studies of selected grantees and or program components that appear to be more effective in realizing participant goals uh, for career education and employment. Um, now I'm going to move on to the various analyses that we're going to undertake to address those research questions I talked about earlier on. Um, the descriptive implementation study will address the first research question, how are health professions training programs being implemented across the grantee sites? And in answering the question, the, the descriptive uh, study has two related goals, to develop, first of all, a comprehensive description of each HPOG grantee, as well as of the HPOG initiative overall, to be able to characterize the national initiative. and develop codable measures of program design and implementation strategies for use in the NIE outcome study and as we'll see in the HPOG impact study as well. Uh, I'm going to change the order uh, uh, of the slide a little bit and move on to first to the systems change analysis which addresses the second research question. What changes to the service delivery system are associated with program implementation? So the major goal of the systems change analysis is to examine HPOG grantees' partnership and network structure and whether and how it's changed under HPOG since the beginning of HPOG. In particular, this study component will assess the degree to which these um, 
changes are associated with the goals of preparing HPOG participants for healthcare jobs while accommodating all of their support service needs. The analysis will also examine the extent to which HPOG created or improved accessible entry points into the health profession's workforce for the target population. That's a big, important concern. Finally, I list the outcome study, which addresses the third research question, what individual outputs and outcomes occur. So the outcome study will first of all describe program outputs and outcomes both within and across all grantees and program sites. Second, the outcome study will conduct a comprehensive participant flow analysis, which is a, is a quantifiable account of the degree to which participants reach program benchmarks. For example, enrolling in a training program, completing a training program, attaining a degree or certificate, finding a job, finding a job in healthcare, and so on. This uh, kind of analysis can be a powerful tool in focusing on variable rates of success by grantees, institutional types, participant characteristics, types of training, and you can, you can make your own list uh, any of the other, by any of the other constructs that we'll be measuring. Finally, the outcome study will break down the descriptive analysis of, uh, as analysis of outcomes by looking at outcomes by other variables, such as subpopulations, again, grantee type, grantee choice of trainings, other administrative choices, and so on. Um, this account uh, that I just gave of the analyses leaves open the issue of the fourth research question, what key components and factors appear necessary or seem likely to contribute to the success of these programs? Uh, this research question will be addressed in part by the three NIE studies I just mentioned. Um, individually and together, they'll help generate hypotheses about effective program design and implementation strategies, additional analyses that provide evidence on the association of aspects of the HPOG program and outputs and outcomes are also under consideration. But finally, the HPOG impact study, which my colleague Laura Peck will now talk about, is designed to test causal hypotheses about how training program features affect participant success. I, uh, I retrospectively yield a portion of my time to my distinguished colleagues and express my gratitude for their having set the stage in describing what we mean by career pathways and also the context of the HPOG program. Uh, that said, with my slides up, I will... Um, uh, what I'll talk about today is a little bit more HPOG context, but in particular the research questions that the impact study will be asking and the sources of variation that we get to play with in this study. And then I'll describe the two main strategies that we will follow in examining uh, site level and individual level variation. The HPAG Im impact study includes 20 grantees serving TANF and low income populations in what Alan referred to as service sites, over 100 service sites. Uh, to date, we have uh, about 12 sites who have begun randomization into the, into the impact study with uh, almost 400 in uh, the sample. We'll, we will be building up over the next uh, year plus to a sample size of just over 10,000. And as Alan described, and the same situation exists in these HPOG sites as does in the ISIS study, there's a lot of variation out there. These sites, while they follow the career pathways framework, they're doing lots of different things with varying levels of intensity. Um, the, we can see that in, across the HPOG sites, there is what we are referring to as natural variation, that is each of these programs has their own configuration of services in place that they, that they have implemented. Um, but then we are fortunate in the context of the evalu impact evaluation to be able to establish uh, some planned variation. That is, in some sites, we will be establishing a, a second treatment arm, one that experimentally will test the effectiveness of a particular enhancement. And in this case, the enhancements that we're implementing are peer support groups, emergency assistance, and non-cash incentives. 
Uh, and those are features that also vary naturally across the HPOG site. So those sites that did not yet have those features in place had the option to implement them as part of an experimental test if they were willing to ration access to those through randomization. And in addition to the site level variation that exists, we also have lots of variation across individuals and their experience of the program. The research questions that the HPOG impact study will address include, uh, most generally, uh, what impacts do the HPOG programs as a group have on the outcomes of participants and their families, and to what extent do those impacts vary across selected subpopulations. Uh, but what we're uh, focusing most on in our design innovations are the last two questions posed here, which locally adopted program components influence average impacts, and to what extent does participation in a particular component or components change the impacts that individuals experience? So I'm gonna talk about two approaches to getting answers to those last two questions. Uh, the first ref will refer to the site level analyses. And the goal of our site level or the analyses that are, I guess, motivated by the fact that we have massive site level variation um, is that we were hoping to estimate the impact of offering specific program components, that is, understanding what the average impact, whether the average impact in a site is changed by adding a particular po component to the HPOG package. And as I mentioned, we have this great opportunity by having lots of variation in, in the world, both in terms of the natural variation and the planned or induced variation that exists. And in part because of this, we have what I've termed up here as the bonus of all of this, which is we ha will have an experimental test of the effectiveness of, of these three components uh, and also be able to look at what the non-experimental evidence shows about the effectiveness of those components. And by blending those analyses together, we will be able to strengthen the analyses that we have of the components in situations where they're not experimentally based. So consider, for example, a world in which there are four possible configurations of how the components are distributed across sites. We can see that, the, that components may exist in all sites. Uh, labeled here component F might be something like comprehensive assessments. And then we also have components that exist in some, but not all sites. And within that group of component configurations, uh, we might see some component that exists uh, only through natural variation, not one of those things that we're testing experimentally, for example, proactive case management. Uh, but then we will have this induced variation that exists, for example, with peer support. And some of those, and all, actually all three of the enhancements that we're testing uh, were chosen in part because they already exist in the field and um, we have the opportunity to observe them in both um, experimental and non-experimental settings. And each of these configurations of components offers its own opportunity for inferring the, the influence of a particular component on the impact magnitude. So the, the design then that we um, are using here is, if I wasn't clear, a, a two or three armed experimental design. In, in several sites, we will have a three armed design where individuals are randomized to experience the standard HPOG treatment uh, randomized to experience the enhancement, um, that is everything that HPOG offers plus the new feature, um, or to a control group. And then in the two arm sites, individuals will be randomized to the HPOG program or to a business as usual control group, as, as Alan and, and Howard both referenced, whatever else is out there in the community. And so that's what this um, first sub bullet here identifies the, the services that are available in the community. Um, any of the, con the control group members will have access to, to those services as well as HPOG members for that member, for that matter. And that will reflect what the counterfactual state of the world is. And then we will have these added elements, the um, EFGH, the assessments and um, uh, proactive case management, peer support, other components, and our intent is to estimate the impact, the relative impact, the added contribution that those components make relative to uh, the uh, impact overall. So 
each of the, these coefficients on a particular component listed here is an estimate of the effect of offering that component on the treatment group. And we will have, um, in some instances, experimental evidence on this point, and in many instances, non-experimental evidence. The experiment will measure the effect of the overall package of these components together, which will constitute um, the full program that exists in a two or three arm site. And then individual co those individual components are what we're really focusing on. In some instances, we'll be able to look at the effectiveness of them through experimental evidence, and in some instances, only through non-experimental evidence. Uh, one of the challenges we face, of course, is that what, what if proactive case management is only ever combined with assessment, how do we tease out the relative effectiveness of those, of those pieces? And that's um, what our design plan aims to tackle. And uh, as I mentioned, we have this bonus opportunity here where we will have experimental evidence in the same situation where we have non-experimental evidence to bear on the, sa on the same question. And so um, our interest is to bring this information together to improve the quality of the non-experimental evidence by, by knowing what we think of as truth from the, from the experimental evidence. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly then about how we will engage an individual, uh, capitalizing on this individual variation, and point you in the future to our uh, design report that at some point down the line <laughs> will um, will be made available with all of the gruesome details that I'm, I'm passing on sharing with you today. But in brief, the approach that we'll take to, to capitalizing on this individual variation that exists, um, again, the, the all of these analyses are aimed to capitalize on the fact that we have an experimental evaluation. We have individuals randomized to a treatment and control group, and we want to be able to use that. We don't want to break the experiment, and we want to use the experiment to learn more about non-experimental questions. And so the approach that we will take is an analysis of symmetrically predicted endogenous subgroups. That is, we will be using baseline characteristics to predict program experience. And because those baseline characteristics are exogenous to treatment, um, we know that the, the subgroups that they can um, support creating are experimental as well. And so if we can um, well predict program experience, be it um, participation in a particular component or combination of components, uh, then the difference in the treatment and control group outcomes remains experimental and, and unbiased by various sources of, of influence. And we can then interpret the results um, of, the, of that kind of analysis for those who actually would have experienced the, um, that part of the program that we're modeling by assumption. And so our intent is to think about a variety of um, components for, for this analysis, and we'll make the determin determination of which um, in consultation with OPRE and through the information that we get from the NIE and implementation research. Um, but we expect to think about kind of two main categories of these that I've listed here, that uh, individuals participate in particular program components, that is, they used emergency assistance, they accessed uh, child care support or services, um, or in thinking about a combination of services, they're sort of high service individuals. They accessed a lot of services. And those are things that to the extent that we can model them with the baseline data convincingly are candidates for, um, for this line of analysis. But not only program experience, uh, but also intermediate outcomes are uh, possible candidates. That is, those individuals who perhaps uh, met a particular program milestone, they achieved a credential. Um, we can look at the influence of that as a mediator to their, to their outcomes and impacts. And so the analytic challenge that we face in this is, of course, being able to predict membership into these subgroups. Uh, but as Alan mentioned, luckily we have a very rich baseline data. That, will, that includes um, the standard information about individuals, demographic and um, employment and educational histories, but then also um, a variety of their um, uh, other, other measures that, uh, that they mentioned, self-efficacy and um, motivation kinds of things that, that we think will be useful in predicting the pathways that they follow through the program. Um, this is where we're extraordinarily grateful to 
um, to Molly Irwin and the rest of the, our colleagues at OPRE for allowing us to, um, to innovate in this. A lot of what we're doing is new and really exciting, and um, we're glad to have the HPOG grantees, too, as part of the, um, this project, letting us use them as a, a testing ground for new methods that we hope will teach us uh, plenty about what works in career pathway programs. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we have five minutes or so for uh, questions, comments. Yes, if you can go to the mic. Hi, my name is Ed. Uh, my question is about uh, statistical power. So to, to what extent have you thought about, right, you know, particularly for the induced variation, that's something you can control, but the natural variation you can't so much. So have you thought about that? And as OPRE asks you, you know, have done analysis of sort of, will you be able to find positive effects, you know, even if um, uh, variation is large? We have done plenty, we have, indeed, we have thought about it. <laughs> and we have done, uh, you know, our OMB package and design report includes estimates of the uh, minimum detectable effects that we'll be able to um, estimate g given our sample size. Overall, the sample will include just over 10,000. We don't know yet what the target sample will be for the selected components. Um, but part of what we, have, as a team, have argued is that any information that we can get from the experimental test will be of value to teasing out the relative effectiveness of particular components. And we do have the opportunity to be able to pool across many sites, and so that increases our sample size. Um, the, I mean, I think that our initial estimate suggests that this is a, a worthwhile path to go down, and then in the end we will see what you know, we'll see what actually happens in the field by um, inducing this particular kind of variation. The, the enhancements that we chose to test in the field are ones that an anecdotally have evidence to suggest that are, were they added to programs or if they're a part of a program, um, suggestively um, imply that they would have relatively greater effects. So what the exact magnitude of that is, we don't know right now because these are things that have not yet been studied, and um, so we're excited to have the opportunity to learn something from that. Thank you. Um, Ariane Hegewisch, Institute for Women's Policy Research. Could you briefly say what subpopulations you are interested in, and particularly whether among the low-income individuals currently working, whether it will be possible to look at older women, so, you know, people who don't have younger children anymore and then hence don't get TANF? Thank you. We do have information that would, that would allow us to look at distinct subpopulations by age and, and family status and all of that. The question is how large a group of people would that include? We we have some suggested suggestions about which subpopulations we'd look at. Um, for example, TANF recipients is important. Single parents with children is important. And if, um, you know, women or individuals over a certain age are a big enough group, we will be able to say some things about their experience and results. But at this point, it's unknown. And I don't, I just don't have in my head, you know, the frequencies by, by age group. Um, the average age, I think, for an HPOG participant is in the early to mid-30s. So there are some older individuals involved. Now, I, I would just add that we're prepared to do something similar by site. Uh, and because the populations vary in the sites, there are some, at least one of the programs is for youth, so it won't have any older women. Uh, other of the programs have sort of a broader distribution and it'll come down again to the size of the subgroup and whether we could pick it up. I would add really briefly on the NIE too though, Alan, um, we, we will have a, a very large sample size and while we won't be able to look at the impacts on those subgroups, there's lots of descriptive uh, work that we'll be able to do just by having such a, a much larger sample size of those within the NID, NIE and the program experience that they that they have as documented in the PRS. I, I, yeah, I did mention this, but the NIE has 
to include, since it's all HPOG enrollees, to include 25,000 or more individuals. So that's a, that's a big sample. Well, please join me. Please join me in thanking our presenters, and uh, I'm sure we look forward to seeing results at future recs. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>